In this video, we will attempt to understand the India-China border dispute through a series of five questions. Number one, what is the LAC? Here we will understand how the LAC came to be, its present status, and the associated problems. Number two, why do the standoffs occur? Here we will talk about the root cause of the standoffs. Number three, why is China provoking India? We will look into a series of direct and indirect reasons behind the aggressive Chinese posture. Number four, is the Chinese army really that formidable? Here we will do a strength and weakness analysis of the PLA. And finally, how well is India fortified against China? Here we will explore the relative strength of the two armies and we will see how India has the upper hand this time around. Namaste. I am Abhinav from UPSC for everyone. Let's get started. Since the 5th of May, Chinese and Indian troops have been locked in an aggressive posturing at multiple locations along the two nations' de facto border, known as the LAC, raising tensions between the two nuclear armed neighbors. There has been an aggressive posturing by Chinese troops in areas of Pyongyang, Galwan Valley, Daemchuk, and Dalat Begoldi. Both countries continue to move soldiers and equipments as LAC situation remains volatile. The standoff in eastern Ladakh has been called India's worst ever border standoff since 1999 Kargil conflict. And this is the first clash involving casualties on both sides since 1975. But who triggered it? China did. And what triggered it? Well, there are some direct and indirect reasons, the immediate one being construction of road by India in its own territory to safeguard and secure its borders. This rattled the Chinese and they deployed troops to the LAC. China even sent its air defense systems and radars to the region. And how did India respond? Did India stop the construction activity? Quite the contrary. India continues to secure its borders as it engages in talks with China. India has every right to do so. Military preparedness is not hostility. Now that we have a brief introduction of the issue, let's dig into our questions. What is the LAC? The India-China border is not clearly demarcated. It is a disputed border called LAC. The LAC is a working border which India agreed to only in 1993 when the then Prime Minister P. V. Narasimha Rao visited Beijing and the two sides signed the agreement to maintain peace and tranquility at the LAC. The LAC referred to in this agreement was not the LAC of 1959 or 1962, but the LAC at the time the agreement was signed. And to reconcile the differences about some areas, the two countries agreed that the joint working group on the border issue would take up the task of clarifying the alignment of the LAC. And one must remember that the LAC is not the claim line for India. India sees the LAC as the working border till the time a final settlement is reached. India's claim line is the line seen in the official boundary mark on the maps as released by the Survey of India, including both Aksai Chin and Gilgit Baltistan. In China's case, it corresponds mostly to its claim line, but in the eastern sector, it claims entire Arunachal Pradesh as South Tibet. The India-China border is divided into three sections, namely the western, middle and eastern. The western section lies in Ladakh. The boundary dispute in the western section pertains to the Johnson Line proposed by the British in the 1860s that extended up to the Kunlun Mountains and put Aksai Chin in the then princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Independent India used the Johnson Line and claimed Aksai Chin as its own. China initially did not object when India said so in the early 1950s. However, in the years that followed, it reversed its position and stated that it had never acceded to the Johnson Line and therefore did not see why it should cede Aksai Chin to India. And in 1957, China built a road in the region to connect Xinjiang with Tibet. This finally culminated in the War of 1962, and since then, China has been occupying 38,000 square kilometer area in Aksai Chin. The middle section lies in Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. Here, the dispute is a minor one. It is the only one where India and China have exchanged maps on which they broadly agree. The eastern section lies in Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh. The boundary in Sikkim sector is broadly agreed, but it has not been delineated. And this region is usually problem free. But in Arunachal, there is a big dispute because here China claims that India is occupying an area of 90,000 square kilometers. 
China claims that this entire area, including the strategically important Tawang Valley, is part of Tibet. The disputed boundary in the eastern section of the India-China border is over the McMahon Line. In the years 1913 and 14, representatives of China, India and Tibet met in Shimla, where an agreement was proposed to settle the boundary between Tibet and India and Tibet and China. Though the Chinese representatives at the meetings initiated the agreement, they subsequently refused to accept it. The Tawang Tract claimed by China was taken over by India in 1951. Till the 1960s, China controlled Aksai Chin in the west, while India controlled the boundary up to the McMahon Line in the east. So broadly speaking, the middle section is peaceful, but there are big problems in the eastern and western sectors. And at the root of the dispute lies the problem of perceptions. Whereas India claims that the LAC is 3,488 km long, China claims that it is only 2,000 km long. So there is a difference of about 1,500 km regarding the perception over the LAC. Why do the standoffs occur? As we know by now, there is a difference regarding the perception of the LAC, including both its length and its alignment. Now both the Indian Army and PLA try to dominate the area through regular patrols which become more frequent during the summers. Face-offs occur when patrols encounter each other in the contested zones between overlapping claim lines. So this is about the reasons behind the standoffs. Now let's move on to our next question. Why is China provoking India? Well, there are some direct and some indirect reasons behind this. Let us first talk about the direct reasons. Reason number one, infrastructure upgradation by India. Now to understand this, we must first know something about the topography of the region. The natural topography of the region favors China, which is at a relative altitude and the topography is less harsh. In comparison, the Indian side lies downwards with a very rugged topography, which hampers mobilization of materials and troops. And as a result, India has lagged behind in terms of infrastructure and security deployment. In light of this vulnerability, India has made elaborate plans to boost connectivity along the LAC. The Ministry of Home Affairs has decided to spend 10% of border area development program only on projects in Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand and Sikkim. India is aiming to boost road, rail and air connectivity and rural infrastructure along the LAC. India plans to build 61 roads along the LAC by December 2022. And the BRO has already built 35 roads covering a distance of approximately 3,417 km along the LAC. Air connectivity is also being boosted along the LAC. India has revived its old landing strips and is upgrading its advanced landing grounds. For example, in eastern Ladakh, there are three advanced landing grounds or the ALGs in Neoma, Dolakbek Oldi and Fukche. Arunachal Pradesh has several ALGs including Pasighat, Mechuka, Walong, Tuting, Alo, Vijayanagar and Zero. This upgraded infrastructure has increased India's capabilities of patrolling along the LAC, which is further aggravating the standoffs. Now in the current standoff, the Chinese side has been particularly peeved at India laying roads connecting the Darbuk Shok Dolakbek Oldi Road or the DSDBO Road in Galwan Valley besides a key road in the finger area of the Pangong So Lake region. DSDBO Road is the link to India's northernmost outpost, Dalat Bay Goldie. This road runs more or less parallel to the LAC and improves India's access to the Karakoram Highway. Another road is being built from Sasoma to Saserla, which provides an alternative link to the Dalat Bay Goldie outpost. And this is making China very jittery, as it fears losing the advantage in the region. Now we must also understand the importance of the Galwan Valley and the Pangongso Lake. The Galwan Valley is named after the Galwan River, which was first explored in 1899 by a Ladakhi explorer named Gulam Rasul Galwan. The Galwan Valley lies between DBO and Chulshul to the south near Pangongso, providing convenient access to Shok and areas beyond. And control of the ridgeline along the valley allows domination of the DSDBO road which runs through the Galwan Valley and extends from Leh to the base of the Karakoram Pass. Looking eastward, control of the Galwan Valley 
gives access to Aksai Jin Plateau through which part of the Xinjiang Tibet Highway passes. So control over the Galwan Valley gives access to both Aksai Jin and the part of the POK ceded to China by Pakistan. Now coming to the Pangong So, it is a unique case where the LAC runs through water. The status quo till now has been that China controls about two-thirds of the lake and the rest is controlled by India. Here China has tripled its patrolling boats and has also increased the presence of its troops in the area. Now talking about the strategic importance of Pangong So, by itself the lake does not have a major tactical significance. But it lies in the path of the Chulchul approach. One of the main approaches that Indian assessments show that a major Chinese offensive, if it comes, will flow across both the north and the south of the lake. During the 1962 war, this was where China launched its main offensive. Now here, the LAC is demarcated in terms of finger points. The fingers refer to the spurs of the mountain called Chang Chenmo, which lies on the lake's northern banks. Running from west to east, the finger points are numbered 1 to 8. India claims that LAC is coterminous with finger 8, but it physically controls an area only up to finger 4 and could patrol up to finger 8. The Chinese troops are now present between fingers 4 and 8 and are preventing India from patrolling up to finger 8, effectively altering the status quo. Now let us discuss the indirect reasons and there are many. Number 1. Magic Trick Yes, you heard me right, a magic trick. In the midst of the global pandemic that it exported, China is trying to pull off a magic trick. China is trying to use the pandemic to dominate the world. And like a magician, China thinks that it has the world distracted by the virus. And while the world's attention is elsewhere, it can pull off its tricks. And you don't have to look far for proof. Just take a look at its neighborhood. From South China Sea to Hong Kong, to Taiwan and to Himalayas in Ladakh, China is trying to grab territory in the middle of a pandemic. China is engaged in what may be called a pandemic assertive foreign policy across the world. China insists that it does not want war, but it shows open disregard for international rules. China expresses faith in dialogue, but its army does not walk the talk and it keeps mounting aggression at the border. Number 2. Salami Tactics the Chinese intrusions across the line of actual control in East Ladakh reflect salami tactics it has used to expand territorial and strategic space, not the least looking to wear down an opponent psychologically, carrying out minor military expeditions with the objective of inflicting small-scale military defeats on India suits the Chinese military and political leadership. They are cost-effective, less escalatory and the message gets conveyed. Reason number 3. Mutual Distrust The mutual distrust is compounded by the growing competition between India and China for global economic and geopolitical influence. India is playing host to exiled Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, and China's ever-deepening ties to India's regional rival Pakistan are also responsible for compounding mutual distrust. And over the past decade, New Delhi has looked warily at Beijing's strengthening economic, military, and diplomatic muscle, which has let China expand its footprint and clout even in South Asia, a region India views as its strategic backyard. China, meanwhile, has been concerned at India's growing closeness with countries like the United States, Australia and Japan. Reason number 4. The Nepal Factor In India, focus has been turned to the DSDBU road along the Galwan River. But discussions on the Chinese internet indicate that China remains much more concerned about the newly constructed 80km stretch from Dharchula to Lipu Lake. In the Chinese assessments, India's construction activity in the disputed areas with Nepal has affected China's border security in Tibet. By building the 80km stretch, India has moved its frontier vis-à-vis -vis China, gaining direct access to the concrete highway in the Purang County in Tibet and has thereby changed the status quo in the region. And despite its preparedness, on its side of the border, China is concerned that India still has much more room for maneuver, using Nepal's geographical advantage to challenge China's dominant position in the region.
China is tactically invoking Nepal's history to suit its objective in South Asia. In Chinese discussions, there is recurrent emphasis on Nepal's historical status as a vassal state to the Chinese empires for thousands of years before it fell prey to British India in 1816 due to the weakness of the Qing dynasty. There is a repeated raking up of the Treaty of Sogoli, which is called a Treaty of Humiliation for the Nepali people, where they had to cede one third of their territory to British India, thereby stacking the idea of Greater Nepal and Gurkha nationalism. Reason number 5. Renewed South Asia Policy China seems to be taking another look at its South Asia policy. First, the agenda is to set off a public opinion offensive against India at the international level, portraying India as the biggest and the only destabilizing factor in South Asia. A country with wolf ambitions, which is simultaneously provoking all the neighboring countries irrespective of their sizes. The Chinese campaign in this regard projects India as an expansionist power in South Asia that has dismembered Pakistan, annexed Sikkim, controls Bhutan and is now trampling on the Nepali sovereignty. However, China will come to the rescue and ensure that Nepal does not become the next Sikkim. Second, a section of Chinese strategic community also seems to be exploring the future possibility of a prolonged guerrilla warfare a prompt military action on the India-Nepal border or setting up a three-front China-Pakistan-Nepal challenge to restrict India in the north. Reason number 5. The Doklam Effect – The Success of Operation Juniper China's threat perception vis-à-vis -vis India has also been changing in recent years, particularly after the Doklam crisis, with some Chinese strategists now considering India as the toughest regional competitor or the biggest threat in the region to China's rise. New Delhi is viewed as making use of the international situation, favorable for India and unfavorable for China, to make up for the gap in strength with China and seek benefits or concessions beyond its strength and capabilities. Reason number 6. The Internal Politics of China Xi Jinping is facing increasing challenges to his authority within the Communist Party. And this aggressive foreign policy stand throughout the world could be his way of diverting attention from his own weaknesses. And finally, reason number 7, the Kashmir angle. It is generally understood in Chinese policy circles that by reorganizing the state of Jammu and Kashmir in August 2019, India has broken the strategic balance in South Asia between India and Pakistan that existed over the past half century. Also, the Indian Home Minister's statement in Parliament that India will take back Aksai Chin has made China uncomfortable. China's failure to get international support on the issue has further added to its exasperation. So these are the reasons as to why China is provoking India. Now let's move on to our next question. Is the Chinese army really that formidable? Is it a force to reckon with or is it just a paper dragon? Let's find out. The PLA is the largest military in the world and it has the second largest defense budget in the world and it is under absolute control of the Communist Party of China. PLA and China are engaged in a post-pandemic aggressive policy, be it South China Sea, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Ladakh. The PLA is a party's army with almost no combat experience. The last war the PLA fought was in 1979 where they lost to Vietnam. This army has never really been tested in combat. PLA has only been used to suppress, dissent and has been tested against protesters who don't have weapons. Let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of the PLA. Now let's discuss the strengths first. Number 1. Good Operational Structure The PLA is organized into 5 theater commands, North, South, East, West and Middle. This helps PLA achieve special mission objectives without delay and lapses. Number 2. Significant teeth to tail ratio Which means that the strength of manpower matches the resources dedicated to a particular mission. This enhances warfare capabilities. Number 3. Technological prowess The PLA is equipped with modern day weapons fit for 21st century warfare. Now let's talk about weaknesses and there are many. Number 1. 
party military relationship. The PLA is an armed wing of the Communist Party of China. It fights to benefit the Communist Party and not the people, and that affects the morale of the troops. Number 2. Civil Military Relations The PLA is not an element of the state. Hence, it has no official point of contact with state bodies or leaders. There is a gap which hampers effective operations and coordination internally and there is general distrust with the common man. Number 3. Human Capital China has a conscription system and the PLA has to rely on 800,000 conscripts that have to serve 2 years. Each conscript is trained for 90 days along with 15 days of political indoctrination. Due to this, the force loses 25-35% to combat power for a period of 3-4 to four months annually. Also, this army recruits heavily but it fails to retain professionals. The educated city dwellers often tend to leave. The one-child policy of China has been blamed for this because the children are too pampered to withstand military discipline. The post service perks are also very few and that deprives the army of high quality professionals. At the end, the army is left with a huge number of recruits who are poor and are mainly from rural areas. They do not meet physical and mental health standards and they often prove inept at handling advanced technologies. Number 4. Almost no combat experience The PLA fought its last war in 1979 when the seasoned Vietnamese army routed them. The PLA troops could not read maps and calculate firing distances. And in 2015, as part of UN peacekeeping mission in Sudan, they abandoned their post, leaving behind their weapons only to be rescued by Indian soldiers. Number 5. Corruption Despite many purges by Xi Jinping, the PLA is riddled with corruption. The PLA is involved in commercial activities with no proper oversight. And this lack of oversight allows PLA to demand and spend its budget without accountability. There is no discussion or debate about the levels of allocations, funding or PLA strategies in the National People's Congress. A corrupt army is its own biggest enemy. Number 6. Lack of decision making at the cutting edge The PLA does not allow decision making at the lower levels. This prevents the frontline commanders from taking initiative. This hinders soldiers from responding quickly to developments. The result is confusion and frustration at the lower levels as troops await decisions from above. Number 7. Insufficient Training The Chinese soldiers undergo insufficient training in conditions that are not challenging enough. Military exercises are not seen as a chance to identify problems. The aim is to always succeed. This reduces military exercises into opportunities to impress superiors. The PLA orienteering team was disqualified for cheating at the military world games held in China last year. And number 8. A hostile world China's handling of the corona pandemic and its response to demand for inquiry into the origins of pandemic has turned major powers like USA, Australia and Japan against China. In such a situation, China cannot afford to engage in hostilities at the moment. So this is the PLA, burdened with organizational problems, riddled with inefficiencies, neither perfect nor invincible. So how well is India fortified in comparison to China? Let's see a comparison based on a study by the Harvard Kennedy School. Regarding the Indian Army, the Northern Army Command, which operates in Ladakh and Himachal sector, has a strength of 34,000 troops. The Central Army Command that operates in Uttarakhand has a strength of 15,500 troops. And the Eastern Army Command that operates in Eastern Sector has the bulk of India's forces against China. It has 1,75,000 troops. India's combined ground forces ready to take on China stand at 2,25,000 troops. Regarding China, the Tibet military district has 40,000 troops. The Xinjiang military district has 70,000 troops. And the Western Theatre Command, which functions right along the LAC, has a strength of 90,000 to 1,20,000 troops. The combined ground forces stand at 2,4,000. Now let's talk about the Air Force strength. India's Western Air Command has 75 fighter jets and 35 ground attack aircraft. The Central Air Command 
is said to have 94 fighter aircraft and 34 ground attack aircraft. The Eastern Command has about 101 fighter jets. India is said to have a total of about 270 fighter jets ready for action. As for China, the Western Theatre Command is said to possess several UAVs. It has 20 precision aircraft UAVs, 20 precision strike UAVs, 12 ground attack reconnaissance UAVs, 12 precision strike UAVs, and it is said to have about 157 fighter jets ready for action. Apart from the numbers, the Indian Army is the world's most experienced army in high altitude operations. And India also enjoys the advantage of the newly built infrastructure. If it boils down to a direct confrontation, the balance may be slightly tilted in India's favour.